Okay, started the recording. Uh, let's see. Let's see how day seven is then. Uh, before I read it, let me set everything up. Oh, day seven. Uh, and then touch, touch. Nice. Okay. Let's go take a look. So a giant whale has decided <laughs> why is whale why is whale highlighted? Okay, that's a whale. A giant whale has decided your submarine is its next meal. Do whales eat submarines? I don't think so. Uh, and, uh, and it's much faster than you are. Uh oh, there's nowhere to run. Uh, suddenly, a swarm of crabs. Wow. Each with its own tiny submarine. Whoa. <laughs> uh, it's too deep for them otherwise, I see. Uh, zoom, zooms in to rescue you. That's so nice of them. Uh, they seem to be preparing uh, to blast a hole in the ocean floor. Sensors indicate a massive underground cave system. Just beyond where they're aiming. Okay. The crab submarines all need to be aligned before they'll have enough power to blast a large enough hole for your submarine to get through. However, it doesn't look like they'll be aligned before the whale catches you. Maybe you can help? There's one major catch. Crab submarines can only move horizontally, of course. <laughs> um, so you quickly make a list of the horizontal position of each crab, your puzzle input. Crab submarines have limited fuel, so you need to find a way to make all their horizontal positions match while requiring them to spend as little fuel as possible. Okay. For example, consider the following horizontal positions. 16, 1, 2, 0, 4, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this means there's a crab with horizontal position 16, a crab with horizontal position 1, and so on. Each change of one step in horizontal position of a single crab costs one fuel. You could choose any horizontal position to align them all on, but the one that costs the least fuel is horizontal position 2. Okay, <laughs> so this costs a total of 37 fuel. So basically that's unfortunate because these two crabs are pretty far out, but they all have to converge back to position 2 because because otherwise, all these 1, 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, well, I guess also 4 crabs would have to move to 16 and 14, and that would be much more expensive. Um, okay, I'm starting to remember some things from statistics. Not enough, though, to like have the solution come to me immediately. <laughs> so this costs a total of 37 fuel. <clears throat> this is the cheapest possible outcome. More expensive outcomes include aligning at position 1, 41 fuel, position 3, 39 fuel, or position 10, 71 fuel. Determine the horizontal position that the crabs can align to using the least fuel possible. How much fuel must they spend aligned to the position? Uh, okay, I'm having a moment where I know I should know how to solve this analytically, but I don't. But I, I think it should be something like... The, the closest to everything is kind of like the average position, or, or rather not the average, because the average is not necessarily a position where anybody's in. Which might still be the correct answer though. This has to be an integer number. So like, out of curiosity, what happens if I sum all these numbers together? Um, 
we have a nice way of doing this. I'll do this in, in, in the program. So let me start by grabbing this. Uh, you copy with this and you paste with that. Uh, uh, okay, so this is going to be my starting input. And in my main zig file. Yeah, I'm stealing this. Hello Specs! Hello! Okay, so we have all these numbers. Let me just sum them up. <laughs> you are running your crap somewhere in, I see. How much did it cost you? Um So like out of curiosity, let's just some bit just just do some basic math. Like const uh no bar uh total plus a zero quality dot next uh solid token uh const n equals or to be position Try std dot format dot parse int new size token paste that okay uh, so what are we gonna do I, I'm gonna add the position to total and then I also want a count I also want a counter. And so with this, I'm gonna read all the numbers, and then I will just print both these values. So total is 49 and count is 10. Hmm. What is that? You're listening to this music too? Yes. Uh, I'm I'm hearing it too. I have my headphones on. Ah, assuming you're referring to, you know, the nice fireplace and the Christmas music. If so, yes. It's in the advent of code. It's the advent of code, Christmas mood, right? I don't know. It seemed appropriate. Um, so I'm kind of dumb because I know there is a statistic quantity that tells you basically which is the closest point to all of them, which is where you want all of them to converge. Um, but it's clearly not this. It's clearly not the average. Because the average is going to give me... Well, total is 49, count is 10, so you divide 49 by 10 and you get 4.9, which is your average position. But it's not the answer, right? The answer is 2 in this case. And... And I'm not doing a good job and like adding stuff just doesn't represent what I need to do. Think about how the cost changes when you move left or right in small amount from a fixed position. Oh yeah, you have a problem with Christmas music two step. <laughs> well, at least it's not, what's it called? Um, 
what's the one that you always hear like in supermarkets it's super annoying uh, I think it was like last Christmas I gave you my heart but the very next day you gave it away I don't remember the title of the song but I think that's the one that I hear the most around or used to now there's COVID I don't even remember how the outside looks like <laughs> like in normal situations um So, George Michael, yeah. So, what is it that I want? Uh, let me let me think of a couple of simple examples to see if I can somehow. I mean, worst case, I can brute force it, right? I can simulate these freaking crabs converging to any specific position. and see how it goes but I think there is like a formula version of this I'm just somehow forgetting it so let's say that you have two crabs and they're all in position they're all like one in position 0 one in position 4 or oh no, position 3 one in position 0 one in position 3 you would want them to converge to 1 well it doesn't matter actually because, let me think, it's a matter of cost, right? So actually, when there's only two, it doesn't matter. Any position is fine, I guess, because the price, the cost is, let me think of it. Let me think about it. Zero to one. Maybe I should, I should throw it down. So you have a crab here, then you have two spaces and then you have another crab, Let's, uh, or three spaces and another crab maybe? Uh, what did you use? X, okay. So in this case, this is, this is the, oh my god, this is the center position. But well, this crab will cost one, two to move here. This crab will cost one, two to move here. At the same time, this crab would pay one, two, three, four. So it, it, when it's only two crabs, it's the same. Uh, it's when it's more crabs. So let's say that the situation is different. Now there's there's another crab here. Now what would be the best thing to do? I think the best thing the best thing to do is to move over this crab here because it costs one to this crab it costs four to this crab but any alternative like moving this crab anywhere it's a bad idea because there is no point in moving that crab um yeah there's never there's never a good there's never a good it's never good to move that crab like you never gain anything um so this kind of, even though this crab is not perfectly centered, like this would still be true if that was the situation. Right? Yeah. So in a sense, if a position doesn't have a crab, then you 100% don't want to do anything about it. Um, so it's interesting. So this reduces the possibility to only... You basically want to converge crabs to an existing position. So you know that the answer is going to be a position where there's already a crab. Which I think it's an interesting property. Um, then... Let me complicate this a little bit more. Ooh, also, wait. Uh, you can have more crabs on the same position. Okay, 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 okay. So, so you want this crab here. What if this crab was, so I said that also this would be true if this was super big, yes. Um. But if there were like 
Like, if there were six or whatever, how many... If there are a ton of crabs here, then you would want to move this to here. Um, let's see what people are saying. Two. Need more than two with two, it's just the same cost. Yeah, I, I agree. So, I, I came to the conclusion. Hey, Kodemong, hello. Uh, there are some special properties the input must have in order to have a single unique solution. Your input has those properties. Ooh. Um, okay. Well, I guess one is that it needs to have more than two crabs. <laughs> uh, the other one, I think it has to do with... Um, So here what helps position 2 is that it has a ton of crabs on it, and it has also a ton of crabs nearby. And then you have the two poor outliers who have to do the full run, but I mean, it's necessary. Um, let's see what else we can do about this. Um, also, you know what I'm thinking, that um, this... This uh, this thing that I was doing here, I think it's giving me a good hint. So it doesn't matter how unbalanced it is, the right answer here is the one in the middle, which is not the average, but it's the median. And I wonder if the median is what I was looking for all along. I don't remember how the median... Oh my god, I don't remember anything about the statistics. How's it going today? It's pretty tough. I um, Today is stressing other parts of... Uh, other stuff that I should remember that I don't remember. So let's do median uh, statistics. Because I think that the median also accounts for like repeated values. Finding the median in sets of data with an... Odd and even number of values. Oh. Oh. In statistics and probability, the median is the value separating the higher half and the lower half of a data sample, a population, or a probability distribution. For data set, you may thought of the middle as the middle value. The basic feature of the median in describing data compared to the mean is that it's not skewed by a small uh, proportion of extremely large and small values, yeah, whatever. Uh, so what's the formula? The median of infinite of number is the middle number. Yeah. So like you sort them and then you grab the one in the middle. If the data set has an even number of observations, there is no distinct middle value and the median is usually defined to be the arithmetic mean of the two middle values, right? So you have to choose between one and two, and then people just do the average or the mean, whatever. Hmm. I think that's what we want because that's the only thing that makes this have sense. That's really what we want. Uh, Infality, thank you for the follow. Welcome to the stream. So let's go with this. Uh, out of curiosity, if we were to order this, what would it look like? Zero, one, uh, one. Two, 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 yeah, no threes, one, four, then seven, then fourteen, and then sixteen. And what do you know? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five. What do you know? Hmm. Hmm. 
we YOLO this. I think we should YOLO this. Okay, let's go grab the input. Yeah, these are big numbers. There's a, there's a lot of numbers there. Oof. Uh, what happened here? What? Is my is my text editor having a stroke? Why exactly is it? What? What's happening here? I'm so confused. What is my editor doing? <laughs> I I don't get it. Copy. Is, is this like because of the number of characters? It's like there's a limit of how many characters can be on a single line before, like visual line before it's like has to run forcefully. 3,825. That's like not, not even a particularly interesting number. What happened? Oh well. Okay, so then we don't want the total, we don't want the count. <clears throat> I guess we want an array, and we want to sort the array, so we want an array list. Uh, I think there is a better way of doing this. Oh man, I think there are better algorithms to calculate the, the medium rather than just sorting. I think you can... Like, you can keep count of each value that you encounter and keep, like, a sorted list of buckets and then you can use that to calculate the mean. But I think we don't, like, these numbers are definitely... Uh, I think these numbers are definitely not enough to justify going through all that pain. So... Uh, let's go steal an allocator somewhere. Uh, which did we use? An allocator 3, maybe? Yay! Uh huh. So let's, let's grab an allocator. Also, I think we used an array list somewhere. Maybe we can also steal an array list. Wow, would you look at that? Let's steal the array list. Uh uh. -oh. We have an array list, but instead of being of boards, it's just of numbers, uh, which go up to thousands, so say U32s, whatever. Um, and we don't care about counting, we don't care about total, but we care about appending. So we do, this is not going to be boards, it's going to be, I don't know, uh, positions. And this function can allocate, so we need to try it. And that's it. So that adds everything in there. Uh, then we grab the positions uh, as a slice. So... Actually, do we need to do that? No, we don't even need to do that. We can just keep on uh, use items. Uh, so how does sorting work in Z? It's been a while since I used the sort function, so I think it's a bit complicated. Uh, 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 um, do you have like sort zig? We do. So sort of zig has binary search in there. Great range pool sort. There we go. Stable in place sort like this. So type a list of like a slice of items of type T context any type and then a function called less than that takes an input whatever you want the context to be it's up to you 
left and right and it tells you if le left is less than right. That's, uh, that's how I understand the signature, which I think makes sense. The context is like for you in case you're doing something special. It allows you like to wire in some extra state Ooh, that we're not going to use. So STD sort. If for less than you can use STD sort ask you 32 nice thank you that's that's really cool uh where can i see this oh there we go use to generate a comparator function for a given type nice so uh so we're going to do std sort uh type u32 um slice the slice is uh positions dot items i think then we had context type uh no it was actually a context instance so void and then the function std sort dot asc u32 nice so this should sort everything in place and then i just want I just want what? I want the item at positions. So items. Uh, square bracket. Uh, there's a built-in I think for clean division. So let me let me go do that. Let me go find it out. I don't remember if it's in, if it's a built-in or if it's in the standard library. But one way or another, there is something that. Uh, does clean division like div div something div 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 exact div exact exact division color guarantees that the denominator is different than zero and this is going to basically return an integer and i think it's going to panic if the division produces like a like a reminder so Oops, that wasn't me. Uh, div exact. Uh, div exact. Uh, does it want a type? No, just two thingies. Uh, so numerator. Uh, numerator is going to be positions dot items dot plan, and denominator is going to be two. That's it. And if it and we have an odd number of thingies. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see once we once we get there. Uh, I'm missing a brace. Yes. Okay. What did I do? Uh, except the U32 found U size. Okay. Uh, because I'm parsing U sizes. That's that's fair. Expected function found. Uh, Type. Uh, okay, what did I do? Oh, because it's sort dot sort, right? Sort is the is the module. This is the function. Runtime value cannot be passed to comp time argument. Okay, am I missing something in the signature? Type items context comp time less than oh so this is a function call it's not being resolved as comp time we just ask to call that function on comp time and this should solve it and the median is 371 can we trust this I don't know let's find out <laughs> Oh, that's not the right answer. Your answer is too low. Ouch. Why? Why is it too low? Because... Why 
what, what am I not accounting with this system? Uh, I would check the problem description. Oh, I think you're right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The cost total 37 fuel. Yeah, right. Now, once I have that position, I need to I need to calculate the fuel thing. Right. Right. Um. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I I was. I was too eager to to conclude. Uh, const uh, median equals this. Okay, so we have the median, and now we have to calculate the cost. So uh, um, uh, var. Result starts at zero, and then uh, for each. Uh, positions dot items e we add to res what e minus median uh almost it, it is the difference for sure but we don't respect the sign, so it's like it's uh, the absolute value of that difference. So p minus median, uh, and then I don't know. Is this a thing? I'm, I'm not even sure it is a thing. So I need to go check that. Now we want result to be just res. Uh, okay, let's go check out if ABS it's a real thing. Oh, it's not. Oof. Um. Actually, I'm not sure because these are not perfectly sorted alphabetically. So let me let me do a search. Okay, yeah, there is no ABS. Uh. Also, why am I assuming that it's a built-in? Okay, I'm suspecting it's a built-in, but I'm, I'm actually not sure it is a built-in. So, uh, okay, let me check all of them. Uh, 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 this, tag name, round, trunk, float to int, field fire pointer, seal floor, pubs. It is the absolute value of a uh, Floating point number. Close, but not quite. Fence, uh, extern, log 10, log 2, export, all sign, source, source, view trunk, reduce, splat. Only in zeros. Yeah. Okay, we don't have a, an absolute thing. Yeah, I think it's gonna be inside math. Uh, I wonder why there is a there's a built-in for floating point and not for integers, or or rather, I'm assuming this choice is is based on how. CPUs usually work, which makes me think that th there is a dedicated instruction for float, but there is no dedicated instruction for integers. I'm guessing because there is like a circuitry specifically designed for floats that do this. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, let's say, let's see. STD.math. Dot abs uh, and maybe once a type uh, u thirty two uh, oh damn uh, uh, is this going to work? It's something is going to complain for sure. I see the math has no memory called abs. Oh, okay. Let's go find out. Uh, math, math, math. Oh, that's mem. Math. ABS int, that works. And the type is going to be the same type. 
Ah, oh, damn it. Okay, so this is going to be annoying. So we can't ABS int a unsigned number because um because yes, <laughs> because it's a problem. So what we need to do is uh this is actually coming becoming more complicated than it would be with like just an if one is greater than the other thing if to be honest. So freaking annoying. Um, but I want to go this route anyway. So we need to make uh, some of this stuff uh, from a U size and I size or a I32, whatever. So if I cast this to I32, this is going to work. I think it's not. Yeah, so this saying, okay, this is an I-32, but this is still a U-32. What are you going to do about it? Okay. So you know what I'm going to do? Here's what I'm going to do. U-32 is way too big. I, like, I don't care. These numbers are going to always be positive. But let me just use I-32 everywhere. So, like, I... Spare myself some pain with this stupid uh, subtraction, and it's always going to work. So this is going to work. This is going to work. This is going. It should all work now. Okay, incompatible types, use size, and error set i32. Okay, so we try to do this. Oh, and this we make i size. Yes, or whatever. Let's make this also I-32. Okay, now it works. Yeah, so I, I should just use... Um, I should just use sign numbers more. It's just that, like, outside of, of this, normally you don't need them. You're good with unsigned numbers, or I don't know. Most of the times I don't need sign numbers. As I'm tempted to think that U32 is preferable to I32 always. Uh, except, well, okay, so you know what? It, it was tempting because I know that the numbers in there are always positive. So that starts me down the U32 path. But then, in reality, whatever. Okay, so is this going to work? Oh, that's the right answer. Nice. Continue to part two. So the crabs don't seem interested in your proposed solution. Wow. Perhaps you misunderstood crab engineering. <laughs> I I I think I most certainly do uh, misunderstood crab engineering. <laughs> oh my god, this exercise! So it turns out crab submarine engines don't burn fuel at a constant rate. Instead, it's change of one step. Okay, so I I didn't comment on this earlier, but yeah. It makes sense, so I have to read the rest, but it makes sense that it's not the same to have one thing go super far and the other stay still versus... Like, there are some balanced solutions where, like, the average splits the, the consumption among everybody, while if you do the medium solution, while overall it's the lowest amount of fuel, a single submarine would need to shoulder, like, a ton of, of fuel their expenditure, so... Okay. Let's just read. Sorry, I, I should not be philosophizing so much <laughs> on an advent of code exercise. Uh, so instead, yeah, each change of one step in horizontal position costs one more unit fuel than the last. The first step costs one, the second step costs two, the third step costs three, and so on. So as each crab moves, moving further becomes expensive. This changes the best horizontal position to align them all on. In the example above, it becomes five. becomes five we we saw five earlier we saw five earlier when we did the mean we most certainly saw five when we did the mean 
Uh, or to be precise, we saw 4.9, which is basically fine. So moving from 16 to 5, 66 fuel. Moving from 1 to 5, 10 fuel. Because this costs a total of 168 fuel. This is the new cheapest possible outcome. The old alignment position now costs 206 fuel instead. Determine the horizontal position that the crabs must align using the least fuel possible so they can make you an escape route. Oof. Okay. So we don't care about the median anymore. Maybe we do care about... Uh, I, I say average. Is there a difference between average and mean? I, I think that this might be an English thing that I'm not aware of. Uh, I think they they might brain them in the same thing, but then why are there two words for it? The term average is the sum of all the numbers divided by the total number of values in the set. The term mean is finding of the average of a sample data. Okay, so this is this is um. So average is finding the central value in math, whereas mean is finding the central value in statistics. So th th this is a difference in terminology that I um, I understand. I don't understand why it's part of the language. So when I did my statistics course, I remember that one of the main points is that whatever is going to be the mean of the entire population, when you are computing stuff on sample data, you're not going to get the mean of the population. You're going to get a, I think we called it like mean with a sign on top of it, which is going to be the mean of your sample. And ideally, as you, if your sample is selected correctly and big enough, then the mean of the sample will converge to the mean of the population. But these are two different values. So you need to keep in mind that one doesn't immediately substitute for the other. And when you are trying to compose com calculations and trying to use one as the other, you need to factor in some uncertainty that comes from, from this fact. I find it very curious that this is in, shows up in, as average versus mean in English. Because we, we basically have the same word, we just say one is the, let's say average, the sample one is the average of the population they're not the same thing but it's funny okay so maybe i should say mean i don't know that sounds mean dub <laughs> mm. okay sorry I, I don't know why i'm being stupid about this okay let's go back to the problem so um is the mean the right answer do i know for sure if the mean is the right answer i don't know for sure i suspect it is because given that this new formula makes it very expensive to move away from the mean, I'm really thinking that the mean is the sweet spot. I don't know for sure. I think I, I suspect that also before with the median, I'm kind of suspecting there might be configurations of the input where, where I'm not sure about this, but maybe there is a combination where the median is not exactly the right answer. I don't know. Maybe not. But with this, I'm starting to suspect a lot more that, that the answer is not exactly the mean. But the mean is the by far the most probable answer. Given how steep this cost function is. So... May probably the correct general solution requires to not just YOLO compute the mean and then from there build the cost but it maybe it requires to do something different i think that whatever the answer it, it's can i can i be sure that the answer whatever it's going to be is going to be near the mean maybe no i don't know i think that if my if my hunch about this not always being the mean is true then it's probably a problem with like multiple local 
optimas so you you basically need like you can hide a global optima somewhere away from the mean if that's true if my original argument is true which i don't know if it is or not so if that's the case then it's a bit more complicated but uh i don't know let's work under the assumption that we can make do with just the mean, uh, the mean. <laughs> and if it works then great uh so i can calculate the mean but then i need to calculate the cost so i need basically a function that gives me this a function that gives me how many uh steps the ship needs to move and how much cost that will correspond to so we have two jobs ahead of us uh let's start with with the ever the one about averages so uh instead of the median what we do is we sum everything each additional items uh, for each position we do sum plus equals p and then and then we do average or sorry, mean going to be sum divided by uh oh here's the thing so this is going to be a float number this is going to be interesting uh so it's going to be a uh, sum divided by um positions dot items dot length so let's just take a look at this number Okay, okay, let's see. Expected type use highs found I32. Uh, uh, what can I do about this? So annoying. I think I can do this. I can't do as right. I have to do in test. Okay, let's see. Um, I think Gauss showed that the mean is the best estimate when minimizing the sum of squares. Uh, I think you might be spoiling me uh, what the function is, what the cost function is, but yeah. Uh, you know, that's another of those things that maybe I knew at one point and I'm forgetting. Unfortunately, this is interesting stuff that I never had at basically any use for. Which is a sad story about, I guess, my professional career as a programmer. But it's a much sadder story about the state of our job marketplace, because it's not like I've avoided jobs where this type of stuff is useful. Um, it's just that, you know, sign up forms somehow are much more no no wor no worries i you know i i kind of i maybe i i think i i i'll go through the effort of going point by point but yeah it's the cost function seems pretty pretty simple to generalize from the example um so expected f64 found u size oh come on So, do I need to cast this stuff to float? Is this it? Is this going to work? Uh, I'm actually uh, expected integer type. Oh, y yes. Oops. Uh, yeah, so... Yeah...
I'm really rusty when it comes to float. Right, int cast is not going to cast a float, that's for sure. But there's int to float, at least there's that. Have a different signature. Incompatible types, F64 and U size. Oh man. I I would like one day to like have a um, have a list of all the problems that come from mixing these types together that aren't obvious. So that I can understand exactly when Zig is so so that I can appreciate why Zig is being annoying about it because without that knowledge that like this is just being annoying uh, expected two arguments found one uh oh want to go to float 64 dude why are you giving me the exponential notation so that would be am i correct in saying that that's 484.5 Can you like not give me the exponential notation? God damn it. Do math math no, I want format FMT. What's FMT? Apple floating plant value in Scientific notation. No, I most definitely do not want that. Okay, so D is my thingy. Yes, so I was right. 484.554. So the mean is not a nice number, and it's at the center, but slightly skewed towards. 485 so is that it so i think we can use uh there's a function to do rounding seal return this minus integral value not less than the given from the point of, yeah i guess that's it So, I think that's it. That's a very tiny difference. Well, I guess it's there for a reason. I hope so. Okay, so cost function. We, we were saying uh, 1 costs 1. 2 costs 1 plus 2. 3 costs... cost what was it an example the third step costs three so moving to three spaces costs three plus everything that it costed before so that costs six I'm not sure rounding is always correct Well, we need to derive a um, oh you know what also i i did seal because i saw that it was past five in reality yeah i would want to round so i, I i'm i'm basically this seal is correct only based on this number it's not correct more generally so and, and that's without counting the point that maybe you were trying to make. So let me see if there's like a... Hey, a round thingy? Wow, whatever. Oh, yeah, there was. I think I saw it. Round. Rounds the given floating round number to an integer. It doesn't sp specify exactly how it does the rounding, but oh well. 
Uh, so four is gonna cost four plus. So I, I think we should um, break this down a little bit. This is gonna be three plus. It's, it's basically plus F and minus one, right? Plus the the first one so this one is actually two plus the cost I, I should basically I, I can put real numbers here um I think there's a closed formula for this yeah it's the what is it sum squares thingy um How does it work? Mm. Uh, so like three is going to be three. I'll Google some of squares. I don't remember the precise function for this stuff. Oh, it's in the float formula. Okay. Oh no! I was hoping to cheat with that. Mm. I. No oh, man. Um. So like three is gonna be three. Plus, um, you know what? I sh I should not break this down. I think I like the original thing more. So three becomes six. You know what? I'm kind of tempted to just make like a table of these thingies. <laughs> And call it a day but I want the closed formula uh, 4 is going to be 4 plus 6 right so 10 how do you get from 4 to 10 like that's Uh, wait, is it correct that four costs ten? Okay, yeah. Let me let me double check that I'm doing the chain correctly. So, uh, one costs one. I should maybe also point out that zero costs zero. Not not sure if this is gonna be useful generalizing, but uh, two costs two plus one. Three costs three plus three. 4 cost, 4 plus 6, which is 10. Snip your cat's armpit. I don't have a cat. Um, or ten. Oh no, I sh I should know this, and I don't. That's so sad. Um. Uh, So it's like, let's say, 4 times 3, that's 12, doesn't bring me anywhere. 4 plus 3, 
Do you know about animating sequences? Do you know about animating sequences? Uh, it's been too long, so you know what? There's a good point. So you know what I can do? Uh, one, three, six, ten. One, three. I bet a lot of people have been googling this recently. What do you know? Triangular numbers. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I don't know. Is googling the sequence? I think that's it. Yeah. So what's the closed formula? N time n plus one divided by two. Oh, you know what? I wasn't thinking of the plus one. I was thinking of going backwards and everything of going forwards. Yeah. 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 Ah, so the cost is going to be, um... So the cost is going to be whatever position minus the mean, and actually the mean now it's not a float anymore, now it's a, uh, I32, because we're rounding. So, position minus the mean, we do the absolute, then we need to uh, put a function there. And the cost is going to be, we were saying return, and uh, what was it? N time N plus one. I think this should be div exact. Well, we'll have we'll have a nice panic. Tell us. Is this code in Git somewhere? No, it's not anywhere. I think you make a good point. I don't know if I didn't know if anybody cared about the code aside from like once it's done. I I'm sure there's a ton of solutions to AOC out there, but I should probably push it out. Uh let's see. For what it's worth, did they crash the top list page as people finished too quickly? Wow. Expected I32 found F64. Wait, round is giving a F64? Okay, so I guess I want to do what to int. I think. Okay, so this is the result. Can we trust this? Hmm. Ah, that's not the right answer. Your answer is too high. Okay. Uh, let's see what I'm doing wrong. Also, this is not panicking, which is nice. I found AOC solutions to be a really good way to find out how to do things in Z. Um, I, I think they're they're nice a little bit, although you're doing a lot of weird things that I don't know, I normally don't do when, when programming in Z. Like, I don't mess around with math that much, usually. Um, but if you, if you want... Uh, wait a second, Martin Wickham. Bex, did you change your name during the stream? If this is the exact bonus points, if you can figure out how, why. Well, I can figure out why. It's because this this stupid sequence has this closed formula and they're all integer numbers. That's why. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I'm sure there's a better explanation for this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So let's see. Uh, Tijb, thank you for the follow. Gargojas, uh, Kim Sormin, thank you everyone for the follow. 
So the mean is a good estimate, but you might have to look around for the actual minimum. Hmm. So that's uh, really it. One of the numbers you multiply is even, so dividing by two is always integer. Point. Ah, I switched to my phone. I, <laughs> I see. Oh, I see. So you have two different accounts, so you view bot yourself with one viewer, huh? Hmm. <laughs> so. So then, then it's really it then that the mean is not optimal? Is that it? So you know what? This is what I'm gonna do. So, originally this was seal. Let's do floor now. Oh yeah, floor is a little bit better. I, you know what? I should have tested... I should have tested this earlier. Floor, it's definitely a little bit better, and I can do, I can do all kinds of, of stupid things, right? I can do, I can do mean minus one, so I'm moving the mean off by one. Worse, I can do plus one. Worse. This really seems to be the nice number in the area. Yay! Uh, day 7 is completed. Uh, let's go. Number 8. 7 segment search. No! Oh, I'm already in pain. Oh no! I'm already in pain. Um, oh shit, this entire visual representation of stuff. Okay, I need more tea. <laughs> I need more tea. I think mean gives the optimal real solution, but the optimal integer solution could be either side. I, I think you're definitely right, Martin. Uh, there's always a problem when you're mapping, um, when you're mapping like a continuous solution to a, to a, an integer solution, like to a discrete solution. A discrete solution has sometimes weird corners around it. And for more complex problems, I'm, I'm like remembering all all the times when we were doing like simplex. Is it called simplex? I think it is. Am I am I not saying wrong stuff, right? Simplex is the fiat crypto pioneer. Oh god, no, uh, math. I don't know what to call it. In geometry, a simplex is generation not a triangle. No, that's not even that. Uh, simplex algorithm. Yeah, for linear programming. Well, anyway, when you're trying to solve these systems, it's always annoying because you have to deal with um, discrete versus continuous stuff. So, yeah. Okay, you have a good instinct. It's a painful problem. Oh, shit. Yeah. So the fact that there is like a graphical representation makes me worry about this. Um, okay. Hmm. For what it's worth, I think most people simply iterated all the possible positions at day seven and tested the way forward. I used binary search, so it was as close to instant as it gets. I see. I, well, I guess that's a reasonable approach. I don't know. So I didn't go this route because it, on one hand, I wasn't entirely sure that the problem would be tractable at this size. Like I would have, I would have needed to do like some due diligence um, with like how big the range of numbers in here. He is how many numbers there are in total and how long it's going to take to do everything. And probably if you do, if you go full naive, it's going to be untractable because like if you don't have the closed formula, unless you at least do some memoization, like you build a table, 
then it's gonna take forever to do this straight away um straight up and maybe you can make do maybe you can do it if you get this right maybe you can do it and if these numbers aren't like too insanely far apart but i don't know i i was smelling the analytical solutions so i i kind of gambled a little bit i guess like if you i i wasn't lying i i don't know 100 i didn't know 100 that that was going to be the right solution i was just smelling the the in the water that there was an uh, an uh, analytical solution laying around somewhere uh also let's remove this plus one so yeah uh okay so you barely reach the safety of a cave when the whale smashes into the cave mouth collapsing it sense of indicate another exit to this cave at a much greater depth so you have no choice but to press on if the submarine slowly makes its way through the cave system, you notice that the four-digit seven-segment displays in your submarine are more functioning. They must have been damaged during the escape. We'll be in a lot of trouble without them. So you better figure out what's wrong. I don't know, dude, I'm a programmer. Hardware problems equals I lose all my powers. Nothing makes sense. It's all undefined behavior. Uh, each digit of a seven segment display is rendered by turning on or off any of seven segments named A through G. Okay. So to render a one, only segments C and F would be turned on. Yes. The rest would be off. To render a seven, only segments A, C, and F would be turned on. The problem is that the signals which control the segments have been mixed up on each display. The submarine is still trying to display numbers by producing output on signal wires A through G, but those wires are connected to, send to segments randomly. How did that happen? How did that happen? Uh, oh wait, so without a closed format, it still only took like one second. Uh, did you did you do this in Zig or a higher level programming language? Because in uh, like I suspect that if I was doing Python, it would have become weird. But you're right. In the end of the day, like the coordinates crystal so still compiled. Okay. Um, I would be curious to see how like yeah Python would fare in this case. So 20 times slower or so, which is actually still reasonable, like if it takes 20 seconds, whatever. I mean, unless like you are competing, okay. Okay, so at the end of the day, this was like still very tractable, even if you weren't trying to fish for an analytical solution. Hmm. Uh, worse, the wire uh, segment connections are mixed up separately for each four digit display. Nice. How many displays do we have? All of the digits within a display use the same connections, though. So you might know that only signal wires B and G are turned on, but that doesn't mean segments B and G are turned on. The only digit that uses two segments is one, so it must... Oh, shit. <laughs> Okay, is one, so it must mean that C and F are meant to be on. Uh, with just that information, you still can tell which wire B, G goes to which segment C, F. For that, you'll need to collect more information. Of course, uh, this is like the, um, I think the closest to this last year was the exercise with like uh, train tickets. I think for some reason you had like a ton of train ticket photos in one exercise and and then you were trying to decipher oh and they were in another language so you didn't know which number corresponded to which i think it was either that or there was another one with like ingredients maybe i don't remember but like the ones where basically you it's a bit complicated, right? You need to start resolving the constraint and it's like a, a, basically a Sudoku. 
So for each display, you watch the changing signals for a while, uh, make a note of all 10 unique signal patterns you see, and then write down a single four digit, oh, okay, wait, let me reread. For each display, you watch the changing signals for a while, yes, make note of all the 10 unique signal, signal patterns that you see, and then write down a single four digit output value, your puzzle input. Using the signal patterns, you should be able to work out which pattern corresponds to which digit. For example, here's what you might see in a single entry in your notes. A, C, E, D, G, F, B. Each entry consists of... Also, why is there a pipe here? Consists of 10 unique signal patterns, a pipe delimiter, and finally the four digit output value. Okay, we did an entry. The same wire segment connections are used, but you don't know what connections actually are. The unique signal patterns correspond to the 10 different ways. Okay, so these are basically the 10 numbers. So this is one, I guess. And then this is dub, is seven. No, yes. This is one, this is seven. So you know that D is the upper segment in this case, but you don't know A, B, which is which of the two vertical segments. And then I guess you have to figure it out with all the other numbers. Okay, interesting. Um, and finally, the four digit output value. Uh, Within an entry, the same wire connections are used. Okay, okay, okay. The unique submarine correspond. Where is the submarine tries to render the, the um, sorry? The unique signal patterns correspond to the ten different ways the submarine tries to render a digit using the current wire segment connections. Because seven is the only digit that uses three segments, dub in the above example uh, means uh, means that to render seven signal lines D, A, and B are on. Because four is the only digit that uses four segments, E, A, F, B means that render a four signal lines E, A, F, and B are on. Using this information, you should be able to work out which combinations of signal wires correspond to each of the 10 digits. Then you can decode all the four digit output value. Unfortunately, in the above example, all of the digits in the output value use five segments and are, and are more difficult to deduce. Okay, but in theory, if you do that correctly, you should have a final, like once you deduce everything, then these are easy to compute, no? <laughs> okay, so for now, focus on the easy digits. Oh shit, <laughs> of course. Okay, for now, focus on the easy digits. Consider this larger example. Because the digits 1, 4, 7, and 8 each use a unique number of segments, you should be able to tell which combinations of signals correspond to those digits. Counting only digits in the out counting only digits in the output values, the part after the pipe on each line, in the above example, there are 26 instances of digits that use a unique number of segments highlighted above. In the output values, how many times do digits 1, 4, seven or eight at PR. Why is part one... Wait, wait a second. So there has been a lot of introduction to then just make me count how many of these use like one for, well, whatever the number of segments these numbers use and that's it. I guess, is part one really just to help you set up the parsing functions? Which... 
what the heck is gonna happen in part two? <laughs> I mean, okay, you need to ma remap everything, which I guess it's the, the hard part. Okay. Give me a couple of minutes to uh, get rid of some uh, tea. No. And I'll be right back. And I'll start the exercise. Okay. So let's do part one. Be easy. Uh, They ate Windows Zig. Let's steal some code. Do I need a drum purpose allocator? Oh, I definitely think I do. Is it starting day eight? Yes, I am. It's time. It's time to do day eight. So, how am I going to do this? Mm. So, right now, the parsing thing is basically making me ignore everything before the fight, which is interesting. Um, so I'm a, how am I going to tokenize this? Also, here's another interesting thing, at least given the current rules. Given the current rules, every single line is completely independent from the others. In the sense that every every reasoning that you do on one line doesn't apply to any of the others, and um, <laughs> I'm guessing this might change afterwards. I don't know, but um, so for now, and and also we're not even being asked to solve each individual line now. So you know what? It might be that I I suspect that this property is gonna uh, carry also on the second half. So. I'm basically going to iterate the line by line, and I'm not going to try to store all lines at once. I don't need this for part one. I suspect I won't need to do that for part two either. Uh, I really muddled my way through day eight. Ouch, 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 ouch. Okay, I, I'm, I'm assuming the second part because the first part seems easy, but we'll see. So, um... How do we do this? 
equal var ip equals stream mem dot tokenize bytes input uh did i put anything in input i did not put anything in input so let's go find the input Cute. So tokenize input and my delimiter is going to be a new line and also the pipe wait uh and maybe more so i want to tokenize on spaces new lines and also pipes i think or i can skip i don't know you know what i'm gonna tokenize the new lines and spaces and i'm gonna skip the pipe as a as a sanity check that i'm tokenizing correctly so uh while at.next we grab the first token uh i don't know let's call it t1 there's gonna be a bunch of tokens this this time uh so we get t1 and now what do i want to do i want to get all 10 thingies to the left so i'm gonna put them in an array i think bar uh, unique digits is going to be an array of n and what n oops uh 10 slices because each item in there is going to be basically a slice into the input corresponding to the string we have the unique digits that's going to be those uh and also we set it to undefined so here's the thing uh do i set it to undefined yes i set it to undefined uh then there's going to be the pipe and then there's going to be the final four digits i don't know final digits Okay, so for each digit inside unique digits, we want a pointer because we want to make changes to it. Uh, that's my point B. Uh, what are we gonna do? We're gonna say uh, <coughs> e dot star equals uh, it. Oh, ouch! That that's painful. We have this while loop. We have this while loop that's gonna grab the first one, which makes this for loop really annoying. So I don't think I want this while loop to be like this. Or I could make the while loop be. I think I want a while through. So the, the while loop is just going to continue running and then here we do it.next dot question mark we do, we do 10 of those and then uh let's assert that the next one it's the it's the It's the pipe sign, so uh, if if not, std.mem.equal u8 uh, the pipe sign, right? That's how this should be with it.next question mark. If they're different, then panic. Bad parser. Uh, and if this has no problem, then we can do basically the same for final digits. 
Okay, so with this we should be parsing everything correctly. What's our end condition here? Uh, I think the end condition should be that... What's the end condition? The end condition is that here returns null. Uh, so let's do or else... Break. This is not super robust, right? You wouldn't want to or else break out of this while loop at random. If you were trying to validate... Uh, like if we were trying to parse input that you don't trust to be perfectly correct, to be perfectly what you expect. But I mean, we can cheat a little bit since it's advent of code. So basically what I'm doing here is, this is gonna work correctly until the end, until until a new while loop starts. The new line is like, there's no more data. We consumed everything. The it.next fails and that's when we break. That's That's the hope. Okay, so we parse everything. We parse the line. Now what do we do? We actually only care about final digits. Uh, what does that break from the four or the while? Oh, you are absolutely right. Thank you. So yes, this break actually is going to break from the four, which is not what we want. Uh, thank you. That was a bug. Now this is correct. Thank you, Boomerang. Yep. Uh, now it's correct. Or at least more correct than before. Uh, so we do this and then what do we need to do? Um, yeah, we only care about the final digits in this case and we only care about the length. So we switch final digits dot len and if it's uh, what, were, what were the magic numbers? So 1478 were the digits with a unique number of segments. So let's go. Okay, one is length two. So if it's if it's two. Oh my god, why am I so bad at what? Uh oh no. How did I do this? Oh shit! Is this is this it? Okay. <laughs> so I have a split keyboard, and I have no idea how I um, <laughs> how I uh, press the um, key cap. No, sorry, the um, caps lock button, uh, which was preventing me from typing numbers. Anyway. We're set up. So uh, it was one, four, seven, eight. So one is two, four is four. Seven, eight, right? Seven is three, eight is seven. So like this, I guess. So in those cases, we want to do something else, we want to do something else. Um, what is it that we want to do? How many times these special digits appear? Okay, so we want basically to do something like this, I think. Like this yeah plus equals one in those cases plus equals zero in the other case we need to make the counter and once we're done to break out of outer then we can print This exercise is kind of weird, it's worrying me. Unused local variable, the allocator. Uh, yeah, let's comment this out for now. 
might not even need it anymore. 200. Weirdly round number. Hmm. I could actually have done this on the fly without even needing like a an, another. Wait, I'm dumb. I am totally dumb. This is not final digits. This is this needs to happen for each final digit, and it's not final digits the length. It's the length of each element in there, <laughs> because otherwise the final digits length is always gonna be four. Okay, so yes, this number is suspicious, <laughs> and it's also totally wrong. So we need to do this for each of the final digits. Okay. So for each of the final digits. You do this with d dot land. Yes. Uh, okay. Cannot store runtime value in type home time int. Okay. Uh, boring. So the problem is that this is an expression, and in the current compiler, the type of this number doesn't really match nicely the type of counter when it should. Which is annoying and like you can basically trick it by or rather make it work by doing this view size but whatever so i should not be trying to be clever with expressions so let me just do this if it's an else case we don't do anything otherwise in the good case we do uh counter plus equals one there we go 367. That's more like it. Nice. Okay, part two. Through a little deduction, you should now be able to determine the remaining digits. Consider again the first example above. After some careful analysis, the mapping between single bars and segments only makes sense in the following configuration. Uh, so the unique single pattern should would correspond to the following digits. Then the four digits in the output can be decoded. Uh, yes. Therefore, the output value for this entry is 5353. Five, Following the same process for each entry in the second larger example above, the output value for each entry can be determined. Blah 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 blah. Adding the out, adding all of the output values in this larger example produces six one, which is what you need to do, right? So determine each one segment, then add the numbers. Okay. Oof. So, do we care about this anymore? We don't really care. I am not in the right mindset for this type of problem. <laughs> uh, so, basically, what we need to do is apply a series of rules to our numbers to reduce the possible matches until we get to the point where each item can only be one match. So I, I think this is a reasonable way of representing basically our search. So. My idea is basically, let's say that we have in unique digits, right? So now we basically have to do things uh, with unique digits. Oh, actually, I don't know why I'm delaying uh, finding the final digits. It doesn't matter. Also, wait. Let's copy everything. So we don't care about this. Um, okay, so as I was saying, it's like, like originally we have the first slot, right? Slot number one in our unique digits. That could be one or two or three or four or five, six, seven, eight, nine or zero. Uh, we do also have zero right in here. 
Yes. So it could be any of those, but then uh, we can remove possibilities as a starting point. We know that if it's any of these lengths, for example, it's not going to be one. It's not going to be, uh, I don't remember what was it for, right? Four and then seven, eight, I think. Right, because these are the special ones, one, four, seven, eight. So yeah, so maybe we find out that since it doesn't have any of these lengths, it's none of those. And so by by doing this, we can reduce the the, the potential options everywhere. And ideally, we should be able to basically every single time we should be able to reduce uh, each option for the like the possibilities for each item just to one configuration so we need to make sure that we discover all the rules necessary to get there and apply them correctly so let's let's do this so for each unique digit then here's what i'm gonna do uh let's not make this an array of slices anymore let's make it more complicated so const uh digit is now uh, wires on let's call it wires which is the what we read from the input uh hey cyber cyber depressed so <laughs> thank you for the follow welcome to the stream why are you cyber depressed so um Okay, so we have the wires, and then, um, what should we call it? So, it's like Sudoku, right? It's kind of the same in Sudoku. You don't know each cell what option could be. You know what it cannot be, and you try to reduce the set down to just one remaining possibility. Uh, so, wires, and then... Uh, candidates? Yeah. How would, how would you encode candidates? How do we encode candidates? U10. Yeah, I was thinking the same. Or I could make an array of 10 booleans. And be lazy with it. I don't think I, I this probably I think it's gonna be like super easy to solve. It's just a matter of or something be set 10 if you want more structure. What about 10 booleans? What's wrong with that? <laughs> I mean, this thing is gonna be super easy and fast. Like, the input is minimal, the difficulty is all finding the, the thing is. I think I'm going for the 10 booleans. Can do book operations on an array of 10 booleans. Ooh. That is true indeed. That is indeed true. Like counting zeros, counting ones. Hmm. I don't know yet all what bulk operations will I need to do. I will need to do on candidates. Let me think. I want to remove uh, an option I want to count how many candidates uh, are remaining um, and then I want to identify which candidate is remaining which is gonna be like count leading zeros or something like this So you know what? I, th I, th I think you're right. So I, I'm not... I'm tempted... I don't want to go down the bit fiddling path, but it might... Re um, like, just because it's more efficient. But I, I think at the end of the day, yeah, you're right. The operations that I have at my disposal, like bulk operations, are are nicer this way. Uh, unit and intersection can be useful too. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we'll see how it, it the code uh, will shape up. So, uh, as we grab these numbers, so these now are going to be digits, and for each of those, we want to make a new digit. So dot wires is going to be this and dot candidates is going to be all ones actually i can put it in the the point initializer i guess what's all ones uh std max max int i guess is there a better way not zero maybe max do you recommend a better way to represent this than this oh as u10 i have to specify as u10 okay i didn't know this uh unable to perform binary not operation on type com time int you are right Okay, it works. You need to specify as the tilde can do tilde on a complement. Yep. Yep. Okay. It would flip infinite bits. Yeah, but at the same time, like you, I don't know, isn't this like a special operator? You could kind of think, oh, this is a literal, this is a U10. I get what you're trying to do and I'll do it for you. Something like this. I don't know. Um, okay. So we grab the wires. Uh, so... Christoph, I love you. Can you be my dad? I don't think I would be a good dad. Okay, so we grab the digits. We set everything up. Okay, let's do the rest of the computation then. Actually, this can be on a single line at this point. And I don't know why I'm doing this manually. ZFMT, do it for me. Thank you. Uh, okay. So what I want to do now is start applying the rules. And I wonder if like cascading once the rules is enough or if we need loops because I don't know all the rules yet. So let's start by the rules that we know, right? We know these rules here. So for each of the unique digits, here's what I'm going to do. Apply special plank rule oh wait a second here's a problem though i'm forgetting something so this uh, this uh remember they only need to identify the four numbers on the right side not necessarily all the ones on the left that's a that's a good point there's also another point i'm thinking of I, i'm actually thinking this somewhat in a backwards way in a sense because I'm trying to find the candidates for each digit, and I know that I can remove some candidates straight up by applying like the special length rule, but in reality, that's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is assign each segment to, to the correct thing. So more than worrying about which digit is gonna be, uh, like which entry is gonna be which digit, I my rules need to need to be more precise and need to be about the position of each potential segment uh, of each potential wire which is annoying it's a bit more complicated than this so
Let me think about this a bit more. Because the special length rule, what is the special length rule going to do? Yeah, it allows me to solve some digits, that's for sure. But when I'm thinking of segments, uh, it's possible to figure out all this math thing of all segments, but there are solutions that don't do that if you want to be tricky. Yeah, and what I care about at the end of the day is the segments, not really the digits. Although, yeah, I only care about the ones to the right at the end of the day. Oh, wait a second. There's also another thing. Oh my god. F, D, C, A, G, B. Yeah, so look at this. C, G, G, C. C, G, G, C. So you can't even... You, you can't even... Um, just compare them to know they are the same because your the order doesn't match like this one i think a a b c d this is everything except e so it's this i think these are the same digit but the string is sorted in a different way oh shit okay uh, So, so should I do this instead of by digit, by other, by other things? Uh, the Panther, thank you for the follow. Welcome to stream. Hmm. So there's gonna be basically how many segments are there in total? A through G. A B C D F. No, A B C D E F G. Seven. Seven segments. What's in the title? Why am I counting? Um, should I do then for each letter, which of the seven positions it can assume? And then when I found a when I find a one, I know it's gonna be just position C or F. Which I need to make sure I don't con like I don't mess up wire letter with display letter. Okay, let me think about this. So now maybe I need to do both. Maybe the two ways of representing constraints need to flow from one or the other. So I need I need to say I need to reduce everything to this, but then my only option is I find, I read the digits, where is it? So I read the digits, I find A, B, which I know it's a one, which means that A and B can only be C and F. So this reduces the possibility of A and B. Then I need to find another, um, another special one like dab. Dab is three segments, which is a seven, and contains A and B and also D. So I know that I, this is what I was thinking about in the beginning, right? I know that D can only be the upper one at this point. So there's probably like a list of operations that always works particularly well, like they can be fixed. So like I start by finding the one with the one. By doing one and seven, I find the upper segment. I know which which is the upper segment. So then I can do the four because the four has another unique number of segments and 
I'm I can I and I can subtract one from four. I'm gonna be left with two numbers here. It doesn't help much. I think eight is another special number, yes. But that doesn't help me either. So I can recognize the upper segment via one and seven. I think that's how that's how it has to be done, right? Uh, do you have any good recommendation for getting started with Zig? I've tried a few times, but I have trouble wrapping my head around the development style. Uh, so, TIGB. Um, what type of development do you do? I think you... Okay, so when I was really in Rust, I leaned into the great STDB docs and book, hoping there's a few things kind of similar. So, yeah, there, uh, there is a little bit like that, although not as much as there is in, in Rust. I think he's uh, a bit too young for that, or at least compared to Rust. So I can show you a good starting point. So if you go to the Zimian website, there's a learn section. And in there, you can find this, which is really useful, the language reference. This tells you about the language, not the standard library. <coughs> and there's also a link to the standard library documentation but I recommend you don't use it because these docs are experimental and incomplete. And one thing that I think it's very, very much doable in Zig, that it's not as doable in Rust, and that it's definitely not doable at all in many other languages, is reading the standard library source directly. It doesn't sound maybe appealing because you're saying, oh, but in one documentation, why do I need to read the standard library itself? But I have to points here. One is, if you want the ultimate authoritative source of how something works, reading the source, there's nothing better than reading the source code. But number two, I promise you, documentation on the standard library is really how to generate docs from the standard library or a package. They are really really just a slightly more digested version of the same information it's like it's not really that much better it's you're used to think that the standard library is not approachable because oftentimes it's not i don't know the, the java standard library is it fun reading the java standard library most probably not um but in the case of zig where like readability and everything else tends to be one of the main goals it, it really, you don't gain much by reading the, the other thing. So there's this, um, I open the standard library documentation, and then from there I click consider reading the, the stdlib source in the meantime, right? And that brought me to this page, um, which is a wiki page on the Ziglang wiki. And if you read this, this is going to tell you how the standard library is structured. And it's so easy. So there's basically, for every module in the Zig, uh, standard library, there's a upper level file and if there's more stuff there's a folder with the same name where the other implementations are but basically you start with the upper level file like the the main math file and you search in there if there's what you need and maybe if you, and everything that's implemented in the math directory here in the, in the math subfolder is re-exposed it's re-exported by Z. So in here, you can find the name of what you need. And then if you want to see the implementation of seal, for example, then you can do inside math seal. And here you can read how this is implemented. Uh, definitely not. That's my work lang. I'm so sorry to hear that. <laughs> I studied Java in university. So I am, I think I understand your pain, at least partially. Uh, so yes, this basically this thing explains to you how to do this and I promise you it this is a very healthy exercise It's not particularly hard. Maybe in the beginning you you won't know you like you immediately uh, right off the bat You don't know what the philosophy is where everything is like you want to compare two strings Where do you go? And if you're used to Java, you are thinking string dot Compare or something like some kind of overload in the string class where there are no classes in Zig, there are no overloads in Zig. That's that's not the case. And the answer in this case is is that it's inside mem. So you cannot have this knowledge, and you'll need to build it to know what the general philosophy around stuff is. Uh, but to help you, there are other uh, resources. So another resource that helps you do this is um, Ziglearn, 
online learning resources ZigLearn is the closest thing to a zig book that we have right now so if you want like a discursive introduction that tells you about how to do things right like standard patterns tells you how do i do allocators how do i access the file system how do i do formatting how do i read and write json uh how do you do random numbers so this is basically going to give you a use case based um overview of the language so but by doing this so okay so this is how i do random numbers cool and this stuff is implemented inside std rand so now if you combine this knowledge you can go in here and say oh i know how to go inside std rand there's a rand.zig file in the standard library so rand.zig and in there you know that all the things that are exported have pub const in front of them if they're like structs otherwise it's pub function if it's functions or generic types and by this you can build a, a knowledge that it's much more real and concrete than what you will be able to do when reading the documentation also uh one final point that i was almost going uh, about to forget which is very important the auto generated documentation is going like everything that you can learn more easily from the auto generated documentation in form of like comments and stuff like description of stuff which is neat it's also present in the source code, right? So these triple slash uh, comments, these are like doc comments. So you can still see some explanation of stuff. So it's not just a matter of you having to reverse engineer what the code does, but like there are plenty of like everything that you would be able to see in the docs is also present in the source file as a comment. And it's, I think it's neat. So um, you can do this. Um, Java has mainly been explored via autocomplete. Yeah, I will try to I will try outsource browsing. Didn't know about the organization file structure. Yes, so knowing the, the, the file structure is not too complicated. Knowing how to find, like read this uh, web page because it's, it's generally useful. Like we wrote this on purpose to help people get started with this. Like this gives a, a nice starting point. ZigLearn helps you with use case based needs like oh I, I need to do sorting how do we do sorting here's how you do sorting and then if you want to dive more into how everything works you can look at the implementation uh and final recommendation if um if you need more there's always zig help in the zig discord server where you can ask people how do i do this and people will point you to the right point in the standard library uh, or they tell you you should do this in another way. So the Z help is also very useful to help you uh, gain an understanding of like mapping mentally how the standard library is structured and how you're supposed to do things. Some things will transfer from Java, some others will not. So be prepared also for that. Generally speaking, the things that don't transfer, they have a good reason for why they don't transfer. Um, and it's it's up to you to like keep an open mind uh to understand why things aren't the same way so for example why is comparing inside std.mem instead of being like a method somewhere there there are there are reasons for all this stuff and like you don't have to like everything necessarily but at least you should appreciate the, the different point of view and uh finally i told you about the standard library I told you about ZigLearn. I told you about asking the community. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Oh yeah, one final point is that also it depends a little bit on your use case. I think there are some some use cases that today are already covered really well by Zig, but there are some other use cases that maybe are not covered as well. So for example, uh, you want to you you want to write a script that very quickly parses json files and deals with this type of data and something like that you're covered there's a json parser in the standard library uh you want to do markdown i think there's a there's a very uh nice markdown parser for zig but it's i I don't think it's this one, or rather, I don't know about this one. There's another one that's the one I'm thinking of. I don't remember where to find it, though. Uh, I 
Nope. There we go. It's from Kivikak. Common mark plus GFM compatible markdown parser and render. So this one is a very high quality implementation of uh, of Markdown for Zig. So if you have to do Markdown stuff for for Zig, this is a very good library. But let's say that you need to do. Uh, uh, by the way, Kivikak used to be like uh, used to work on the GitHub Flavor Markdown implementation at Git at GitHub. So yep. Uh, but if you want to do, for example, web stuff, you cannot do web stuff uh, super easily with Zig. So you can do it. There's like there's Apple Pie, which is an HTTP server. But then if you start uh, including like SSL support and other stuff that you would reasonably take for granted in a more mature language, with Zig is we're not there yet. So it also depends a little bit on your use case. Uh, Rumi, why why do you need to meme about this stuff? Hmm? This is not an IRL stream. So going back to my digits, what was my point? I think the point that I wanted to make, the one I was about to make, is that maybe there's like a fixed list of operations that you do one after another. And that allows you to resolve everything every single time. So let me see if I can think of a, like a fixed step of operations that it's good enough. So like one and seven lets you identify this one. So we know what this one is at this point. So can we identify uniquely the two? No, because the two is gonna look like the three except for one difference. So actually maybe that's it. Oh, one, two, three, four, five. How many five segment numbers are there? One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so two, three, and five are have five segments. This one has more, this one has more. I think all the others have more. So with five segments, it's two, three, and five. We know the upper what the upper segment is. The ones, the remaining two shared by all three are going to be the middle segment and the bottom segment c is repeated twice while b is present only once f is repeated twice while e is present only once so that allows us to identify, I believe, C, which then through one allows us to identify F. So at this point, we should have A, C, F, and then also gives us C and uh, E and B. So we have a lot of those. Now we just need to disambiguate D and G, which we can do with the four. So we find D, which then lets us find G, and I think at this point we have everything, and I, and I haven't even looked at all the digits. So I think it's just a matter of doing this. Okay, unless I made a mistake while trying this out, it seems to be like a very deterministic, like there is a very deterministic path to solving this, which I think makes this problem, like the approach is different than the tickets one or the ingredients one, I don't remember from last year. It, it's it's more complicated in terms of structure, but this extra structure helps more easily find a clear path towards the solution. So let's let me try to encode this in a series of operations and see and let's see how it works. And I also need to do some normalization of this freaking data because it, it as it is now it's not nice. So let's do let's do normalization. Do we need to do normalization? Let me think. Definitely do normalization. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then maybe that's yeah. Then I sh I should do that. Um. 
where do we do this? Uh, so let's let's say that the digit this is not. Oh no! No! Um. So here's something funny. I'm being punished. I deserve it. So embed file is putting this string inside a. I think it's not writable memory. So I can't in place. Um, sort the strings by modifying the list. So this is const. And I was thinking, oh, I, I just dropped the const uh, identifier here. Well, modifier, whatever the, the const is. I, I dropped the const keyboard and now wires it's an, a slice of bytes that I can modify. The problem is that this thing is cannot be modified. It's not just because input is const. I think that even if I make this var, it's not going to work. Is this going to work? Is this really going to work, specs? Oh yeah, with the dot star. Okay, so I, I was getting there. Okay, so so what I need to do is basically I need to copy this somewhere else. And and what Spec is pointing out is the right way of doing it. So basically you you, you assign this to an array. Because embed file is a pointer to memory somewhere. And by dereferencing that, the, 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 the that pointer, then you get a copy of everything, uh, which I guess can also be a global and it remains editable even if it's a global. So, okay, let's do this. This is not constant anymore. We do this. Is freaking tokenized going to give me constant slices? This was a problem a while ago. I remember hating that. Please tell me it's fixed. Uh, where's mem? Oh no! You need to write const cast. Oh my god, seriously. So, okay, serious question, Martin. Don't, don't you think that this should be like somehow... Th this, this mechanism should be like baked into tokenize directly. Also, const cast is not anywhere, right? I need to like do pointer to int into pointer and toss away the cast, uh, the const myself, right? That's so dirty. Yeah, I think the tokenize should somehow sense that, like, should make the buffer not necessarily const, and then have the token iterator also behave accordingly, like, not just depend on t. But depend on the buffer type, and this is not if this is not const. Why not allocator dupe each token plus array list? You know, Wukumarga, I think you are right. I think I will prefer that to trying to toss away the const, the const identifier. So it would be cool to detect if we, uh, but if we don't have syntax for that, it would be ugly AF. Would it really be so ugly? Why? You can inst so I think you can you can make it work. Uh, it's a bit ugly, but it's not terribly ugly. So you make buffer any type, and then you pass type of buffer to token iterator, and token iterator uses the type of buffer to decide what to do. To basically decide whether to, whether to return. Slices or constant slices. I don't think it would be so terrible. It, yes, this is less nice, I guess. But that's it. Maybe I'm missing some other detail. So, Vukomerg, I think, I think I'm going to do what you suggest. You're writing a tokenizer for AOC. Well, I mean, I actually, I think I had this problem with tokenize also in the past, and it had nothing to do with AOC. I think it was in my, uh, I think it was inside Borg, as I was parsing stuff from Twitch. For what it's worth, I had neither allocation nor cons cast in my solution. Okay, because you're you weren't keeping around slices. You were, I guess, you were keeping around what. Um, you were keeping around 
youth uh, youth hands or whatever. Hmm. Anytime makes interfaces very hard to read. Sure. Are there any plans to limit it? Mm, I don't think so. Because in Zing we don't have like uh, I don't know what do you call it traits interfaces like we do structural typing. So basically, to not have uh, any type and to have something else, you would have to basically have whatever you put there do structural typing for you. And for some things, I think you could, for some things you can somehow do it already because there's stuff like I don't know any frame. This, the the meanings aren't exactly the same, but there's other things. There were some proposals about saying like somehow put a function in here that somehow tr uh, tries to do some structural typing or somehow limit it. But I think none of them got accepted, so I don't know. I've been thinking a lot about a way to do traces that doesn't suck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have some tension there. I think the for now the answer is don't use any type unless you really mean it. And for stuff where you have to use any type, yeah, it's annoying. I guess the best thing that you can do is write a good documentation here and put a immediately like a com time block where you where you uh, immediately complain about types that you don't like, so that for the reader it's not too hard to understand what it is that you want. But yeah, I agree that any type makes uh, signatures worse. Oh, okay, let me think. Do I really translate these slices in, in U10s? I think yes. Okay, let's let's do it. So why is U10 and I don't even know if I care about candidates anymore. I don't think I even care about candidates. So uh let's give this a default value of zero. Um wait, is U10 correct for the for the wires? It's U10 for the candidates. Uh, the wires aren't 10 though, are 7, right? So it's a U7. Um Let me remove the candidates because I don't think we even need them anymore. So each digit is basically U7, and that's it. Is that it? You know what, I'll keep the struct around it for now. Uh, but now this is more complicated, right? Because we need to build the, the U7, which is more complicated. So unique digits is going to be, we get the digit, uh, and then what should the unique digits? Then we need to do it again seven times for each. Uh, we need to do it for each letter, right? Inside it.next. I, I think I need to open a block. So, also, I think I don't care about this anymore. Oops. Let's see. Um, so, traits. Uh, do, 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 do. Traits are tricky because they can easily lead to around it is <laughs> where it spends a lot of time tweaking your API instead of solving the problem there isn't an issue yet the idea isn't concrete enough for that mm -hmm. oh yeah 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 uh, 
Yeah, I agree with this point. Like, I think that for both C and Go, the inability to be to pontificate too much when you're coming up with your types is actually a feature more than it is a miss feature. That's my impression too. Which actually makes me worried about generics in Go because then there's going to be like a, an army of Java enterprise developers who are going to port one-to-one -one their beautiful Java frameworks and architectures, enterprise architectures, filled to the brim with patterns and design patterns and factories and factory factories, <laughs> etc. And and think they're gonna make Go worse. Or at least, it, to me, it, using Go in an enterprise environment felt like that the limitations were actually protecting me from some of the insanity. So yeah, if you make it too easy for people to be too clever with their types, they're going to start going down weird paths. <clears throat> okay, so like, let's get these wires. Though going to have a rough period now after generics. Yep, I suspect that too. I think the question for Go is whether it's stronger the never-ending desire for more abstraction that enterprise development has versus the community having a consistent view over design which I think Go did a good job at pushing forward in the past, and whether that force will win over the other force. It's really a fight between good and evil. <laughs> but like, I, I was so, uh, I always enjoyed so much like how Go says, I, I don't know, no dynamic dependency injection with weird uh, reflection frameworks that do reflection everywhere. And then you have, and then in C Sharp, you don't have anything else other than that. Everything is, is implemented through runtime reflection, uh, even passing arguments down to your classes to instantiate them, um, which is, I don't know, a very stupid way of doing dependency inversion. And in Go, none of that. In Go, you write the damn line, you add the damn argument, and you get a compile error if you don't do it right. I remember in C Sharp always having runtime surprises because, because the entire runtime automagical system to do dependency injection uh, was working through source code, configuration in the source code, configuration inside the XML files. It's like, fuck that. Um, I think function declaration as expression would be enough for most of the interface needs. Oh, uh, we are getting that. What's your day job? Uh, drunk, drunk Time Lord. Uh, technically, this is my day job. <laughs> my day job is um, I work at the Z Software Foundation, so I'm VP of Community, and I guess uh, chatting with people on Twitch about Z is part of my day job. It's not always that nice. Uh, there's other parts of my job that are. Um, less public and I guess interesting to some degree or or let's just say interesting for a software developer who is not particularly invested in Z. Uh, some of which goes through emails, some of which goes through just having discussions with people about things that they want to do. So um, I also run Z Showtime. I don't know if you were aware of that, but Z the show. Uh, so Z Showtime as a YouTube channel, and yeah, there's YouTube videos in there. Some of them are me ranting about stuff. This is me complaining about the .NET Foundation. Uh, this is me complaining about how AWS really loves Rust, and but the, it's not always me complaining. Uh, there's also like this is very cool. So this was an entire episode dedicated to um, to Tiger Beetle, which is a distributed database for financial applications written in Zig. Uh, that implements view stamp replication, which is a uh, distributed consensus protocol like Paxos and Raft. Uh, and they were running a bug bounty for their uh, implementation. And it's pretty cool. So, like, if you care about Tiger Beetle, 
Megabeetle.com. Yep, $20,000 consensus challenge. And there's a bunch of explanation. And, and all of this is written in Zeke. Like this, this guy here. That's Andrew. <laughs> Finally, Tiger Beetle is written in Zeke, a revolutionary systems language designed by Andrew Kelly. Uh, so this is cool. And uh, yeah, so they went on, on, they came to my show on Showtime and we had like um, a good time uh, uh, explaining what, how View Sample Replication works. And there were also interviews with the authors of View Sample Replication, uh, which is like View Sample Replication, it's, it's paper. Or like rather a, a couple of papers. This is the second one. Barbara Liskov, James Cowling, uh, and Brian Oki is the author of the original one. So you could say that Brian Oki is the author of the is the creator of your sample replication, and then it got like improved. Or or rather, like the explanation got improved. I don't know if the algorithm itself got improved much in this new paper. I I have to be honest, I I read both. I remember the second one much better than I remember the first one. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't remember exactly what the diff is between the, the first one and the second one uh, in terms of changes in implementation. But even then, it's papers. So, sorry. I don't know why I went down this this uh, rabbit hole. The point is, there's all other stuff that is, that's definitely more interesting uh, rather than just me complaining. There's also a full game of Secret Hitler that we played on stream for the 0 0.8 release. There's other talks, interviews. This is an interview with Abner Coimbre. This is uh, an interview with JT, uh, who's now a member of the uh, core of the RAS core team. Uh, yeah, and there's more stuff. There's like the Zig roadmap. That's Advent of Code 2020. Oh my god, I need to publish the Advent of, uh, Advent of Code 2021 videos. Anyway, let's go back to our segments. So, we got the digit string. Uh, which is like, uh, let's call it wires. Oh my god, let's call it string, I don't know. So that's the string thing. So for each character in the string, we want to basically... Also, I think I... I think this is how it is. Uh, so for each character in the string, we want to basically flip to one the correct bit inside wires. So how do we do this? Uh, I think we do d dot wires and then what? We we want to leave untouched whatever was there. And then we want to put there a one shifted how many times? So A is should be zero. So we want to do C character minus A, I think. So if C is A, we want to shift one zero times. If C is B. So this should work. Zig is gonna complain about everything. Zig is gonna complain about the one, about the C. I think I can I can solve some of these problems immediately. So this needs to be a U7. Uh this needs to be a what? Uh I think this might need an int cast. Oh, let me try with as. If it doesn't work, I'm gonna do an int cast. Um, this needs to be a U what? Oh my god, log 2 of 7. 3? I don't know. I think Zig is going to complain if, if he doesn't like this. Uh. And use ca and use captures. What do you mean? I'm using it here. Oh, I'm not using it somewhere else, probably. Uh, so yeah, let me... I think this we can delete for now. Expected U3 found U8. In cast. Okay. So this works. Um... Then we should do the same also for final digits, actually. 
right there is no point in having final digits be have any other any different representation than this yeah there really is no point uh okay Also, I think we don't need this. This can be dot question mark. Um, so now we have the wires put in this way. Okay, so we need to start applying rules. Uh, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a bathroom break. I need to return more tea. To the war. So I'll be right back. So, uh, we want to apply the rules, right? Uh, so, I, I think we can write them down here. So, first rule. Uh, 1 and 7 find the upper segment and the 2... So I should use I'll use letters. Uh, one and seven find the A segment. Uh, find the A segment and the A D. I think or where uh, those the C F candidates. Okay. So So how do we do this? We need to do basically 7 minus 1. We need to find 1. We need to find 7. We can do that through their length. Digit one is going to be uh, uh, oh wait, it can be for loop uh, for each unique digit. Digit one has, is the one with two segments up. The one with two segments up, which means uh, if uh, is how do I know how do I count up bits? Count count the number of most digits leading. No, 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 no. Um, how do I count the number of uh, up bits? I think there are there is a built-in for that, isn't there? Up count. Oh, thank you. What is it? Oh, yes. Up count. Nice. And the number of bits set in an integer. Nice. Yes. If 
Dot count of B dot wires equals uh, two. Then we break with what? With D. You know what? I really think I'm never gonna put anything other than the wires in there. So I think my digit is going back to being a U7. Hmm. Yeah. And maybe I should do this. Times uh ten. Probably something is pretty nice, no need for wise all over. Yeah. Uh, and then we want to do this also here. Get four of those. So, two, 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 two. Uh, 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 so not the wires, the. the We break, we break with D. Uh, else, well, if we don't find it, it's panic time. Or oh, let's do unreachable. I'm always going to build in the back mode, so it'll be sorted. We find one. We find seven. Somehow there's a, there almost seems to me there's a better way of doing this than just scanning twice. <laughs> but whatever. Uh, so seven has three segments, right? Uh, also, what's the problem? Expected that I can't found something else. Uh, what? Fourteen. Yes. Okay. One and seven from the A segment and the CF candidates. Okay, so with this we can do um on segment A is going to be is going to be uh, literally digit one minus digit seven, or sorry, digit seven minus digit one. So that gives me segment A. Then. const segments cf is going to be uh segments cf is going to be well i know what cf are because they are digit one like digit one and segments cf are the same thing <laughs> so I, I i don't need to do anything actually about that um Okay, so let, let's continue with the rules. I, I forgot what I, I was thinking of. Okay, so 1 and 7 give me A. So I remain with CNF. Then I was I was thinking 2 and 3. 2, 3 and 5 were my next thing, right? 2, 3 and 5. I know what's A. And I can subtract it from all of three, all of them. And then I can subtract. I know the D and G are going to be the two segments present in all of them. And then I know that uh, C is the one repeated twice. F is also repeated twice. God damn it, that doesn't help me much. Okay, 
Okay, wait. <laughs> I, I think there was uh, something that better that I could do. Uh, so four is also unique. Wait. So oh wait wait wait. There was something between seven and four, I think. Right. Seven and four give me D and B. Yes. Okay. So seven and four give me D and B, and I can grab D with two and three, I think. 2, 3, and 5, sorry. Which gives me D and G. I can then get B. And with B... Okay. <laughs> uh, so, let's do... Let's do grab D and B from 4 and 7. Or actually, it works also with 4 and 1. It's even easier with 4 and 1. So let's grab B and D. I should probably do also... So, digit... Digit 4. Uh, so, I was saying, I want to do... 4 minus 1 to get B and D. So I got B and D. And now I need to disambiguate them. I want to remove D. Removing D... How do we... How do I remove D? I can do it from these three, but I think uh, I think I can leverage more unique numbers. So we have eight. That's another unique number. So if I have B and D, eight also has B and D. So that doesn't help much, unfortunately. But. But if I subtract from 8, A, B, D, C, F, and also E maybe, I remain with G? Let me, let me think for a moment. So, so if I subtract from 8, 4, in the uppercase, I remain with E and G. That's not great. I think I can do something better. Yeah, it is not very useful. Yeah, I agree. It is the same no matter how things are scrambled. That's a good observation. Yeah, it's not really useful. Uh, so I guess at this point I should go back with 2 and 3 and 5. I think 2 and 3 and 5 are enough. I was, I'm was i trying to think if there's like an easier way. Uh, can I recognize... So 9 has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 segments. Can I recognize it uniquely? No, because 9 has the same number of segments as 6. That's it. I think that's it. So these are only 2. So that's nice. There are only 2. 0 also has 6 segments. Fuck, thank you. 0 has 6 segments. God damn it. Um, but, oh, nice. And it's the only one that doesn't have D. Right? So, if I grab 0, 6, and 9... Well, wait a second. No, that doesn't help much because, okay, this is the only one that doesn't have D. Which is cool. Um, I'm mixing up my rules. I'm mixing up what I know. Wait a second. So, so I have segments B and D. Okay. So 
So when I have these three, they all have B and D, but only zero has B and not D. And so with this, I can know they all will have B, but only one of them won't have D. So with this, I can get D and B. I think that's a good path. Two, and then I can do the next with two, three, and five, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's do this. So uh, segments B and D. So I get const uh, digit. Well, no, maybe this is better to do it as a var. Var digits. Ah. Uh, what's this? 0, 6, and 9, right? Uh, it's going to be an array of 3. three u U7s. Uh, and for each of the unique digits if up count equals what one two three four five six so six uh then we want to assign d to an index so bar I think I want to close this in a block it's for better privacy. So, there we go. So this finds digits 0, 6, and 9. And uh, so at this point, how do I find a B and D? I need to OR B and D with all three of them until I found one that gives me only one instead of two uh, up bits. So, uh, find which is B and which is D. So to do that, we want to iterate all of those over all of those for each of them. Which is B and which is D. Uh, so we want to do uh, we want to do the pop count of of uh, the digit minus. Wait, I'm doing minus. Is minus the right operation? I think I'm dumb. I think minus is not the right operation. <laughs> I'm thinking minus. But actually, I think it's not that. I think it's, it's XOR. Am I... Am I dumb? Martin, can you can you please save me? 
Is minus wrong? Or should I do something different or correct? I don't know. I'll keep doing minus for now. Uh, at least conceptually, it seems fine in my brain. Then I'll, I'll figure out what the right bit operation is in case minus is not the one. Uh, so I want to take D and I want to subtract uh, the digit and I want to subtract segments B and D. Uh, no, I, so this is not going to be, uh, this is not going to be this, it's going to be an end, it's going to be like this, because I, I need to, they need to be, so in this case, wait, this is a different operation than before. Yeah, so wait. So here we had a 4, and then we wanted to remove 1 from 4. In this case, we don't want to remove B, D from D. We want to take D, end it with the segments, and only then we get the remaining bits. So end is uh, this. And if the pop count is equals to... So we, we store this. You want to remove the bits that are in segments? Oh, no, in this case, no. I want to keep only those if they are present also in D. So in this case, it's correct. Uh, I'm I'm having doubts here, but I'll, I'll figure it out later. Uh, const. Uh, count, I guess. I don't know. Uh. Common segments. Hey, what do you know? Fork, Ben, EX, Many. Goodbye. Okay, common segments. So if. And I'm done. I don't. I want to actually store those somewhere. If common. If. Uh, of count of common segments equals oh my god I'm getting there okay equals one so if it's only one then we know that the one that that bit is uh b right Yes. Yeah. So bar segment B segment D. They're both there zero. So if pop common segments equals one then we know that segment B is the one that survived and then segment D is going to be segments B and D minus segment Let me double check for a moment. So we found that uh, there's one segment that survives. We know that that segment is B, which makes the other one D. Okay. So we have A, B, and D at this point. A, B, and D. Okay. We have A, B, and D. So we subtract A, B, D, C, F. From 5, we get G. Oh, okay, so the other... 
the equivalence class was five uh one two three four five segments five segments five segments so we subtract all of these from all of these we remain with e and g or only g so we do the subtraction and if pop count gives one we know that we have either three or five on hand and so that gives us g and actually if we are a bit clever we can also keep around the odd one and say well then the remaining one at this point is going to be e uh so we find g and e also interestingly the one that has interestingly the two that give us g oh no this was c never mind but we know that the one that gives us e has c and doesn't have f so that allows us also to subdivide between c and f and i think at that point we have everything Okay, so let's do this. So we want to make a digit with four plus the top segment. Also, also wait a second. So we know which is zero. Wait, you know what? I think we can even simplify this because we know we have zero, six and nine right now, right? and we just find out which is d so that leaves only six and nine and would you look at that six is the only one that can have an overlap with one or, or, or rather if we end six and one we get uh we get f sorry that gives us f I think I want to do this then. So I have these three numbers. I know which is zero. Actually, it doesn't even matter that I know which is zero. What matters is that I know that all of them have C and F except yeah let's do this okay so i found b and i found d Then I do the same, find F and C. And I have F and C somewhere, right? Yes, CF, which is digit one. Okay, so for these two, uh, I was saying F and C, so I need to find F, right? So for, I keep iterating on these three, I do end with one, and when I get a pop count of one, I know I got F. Okay, so I think it's kind of same, just like what I was doing before, just different variables. I'm going to copy everything, actually. So digit 0, 6, 9. Common segments, we we segment the digit with not segments BD, but the segments uh, CF. And if the pop count is 1, we know that segment F is going to be the com what survives, which makes C. 
segment CF minus segment F. Okay. This seems cute. So we have we have A, we have B, we have D, we have C, and we have F. A, B, C, D, F. We need E and G, I think. We need E and G. Okay. Uh, so how do we find ENG? Uh, we need five, maybe? I think we can do the same again, right? Oh my god, my brain is starting to melt because of all these numbers and constraints and, and, and things, but we are getting there. Ah... <sighs> So, can we do more with 0, 5, uh, with 0, 6, and 9? They seem so nice. I don't think we can. Or actually, maybe yes. Doing it last night at midnight was a mistake. Yeah, I can imagine that. So, I think I can... I originally had a plan to use 2, 3, and 5, but I ended up doing everything with 0, 6, and 9. So, cool, I guess. Um, so... 0, 6, and 9, we can do more, right? So, we did this trick twice already to find this and to find this. And... Wait a second. No, we didn't do it with E. What did we do it with? We did it with B and D and C and F. So, we did it with B... Yes, B and D... And we see an F, okay. Now, if we subtract four, so if we make a digit with everything in four and A, everything that for us plus also A, then we can isolate E and G and E is going to be the one G is going to present every, be present everywhere E is only going to be present in one of these three digits which give us E and by the same logic also G and I think at that point we have everything okay so let's I think this is the one that I'm going to fuck up Uh, okay, so I want to do segment. Segment E and segment G. I'm going to copy everything over. I'm already copy pasting too much. I'm, I'm already... I already messed up. I know that. But whatever. So I think we need to make our, our digit that has basically everything that 4 has plus segment A. And I think that that minus is 100% wrong and it should not be minus, it should be something else, but whatever, we'll get there later. Okay, so uh, var segments A, B, C, D, F It's basically digit 4 or with digit uh, with segment A. Uh, where segment A? Wait, do I not have a... Uh, wait a second, I do have segment A somewhere. Do I not? Okay, I do have it. It wasn't just recommending it for some reason. If you just want to clear all bits that are set in A and B, then B and A should work instead of A minus B. Uh, if you want to clear all the bits that are set in A and B, yes, that's what I want. Yeah, uh, uh, 
I'll get there in a moment. So let me just lay down the logic before I, I forget everything that I remember and then I'll fix the operation. Because like it's like once I know that I need to fix the minus with something else, I can just do it everywhere. Okay, um <clears throat> so find E and G. Um segments A, B, C, D, F. A, B, C, D, F. So it's four plus also the segment up here. Yes. So if I do this and no so i need to to negate this right oh you know what yes i i can negate this and simplify my brain logic like instead of doing this i can just do this these are segments e and g and they are the opposite of what i thought i've done here so uh not what is it not this so not four plus a gives me e and g oh thank you like this now my brain is yeah about this more easily uh okay so i have segments e and g so now i do end with zero six and nine and when i get a pop count of one i know i found g If common sense is one, then I know that G is this and uh, E is segments EG minus segment G. Okay, and with this I have everything I think. I have A, I have B, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Okay, I have all of them now. Uh, Now let's fix this minus. So. It's not minus, yes. What I want to do is, so what minus is, is basically and not. So this has everything set to zero except with f. So I want to set this all to one except f and end so like this. I think. Do I need the parentheses? I think I don't even need the parentheses. I can just straight up do this. <laughs> I think that's it. So out of curiosity, digit 7 and not digit 1. Digit 1 is the two segments on the side, not is everything except these two. So digit 7, it's only the second one except these two. Okay, so that should be good. So, okay, with this, I know segment ENG and everything else so at this point what do I do at this point I need to parse the final digits I need to parse the final digits. I how do I parse the final digits? 
I guess I can I can create the ten digits combining the segments or something of that sort, and then I just compare them. I don't think I have a easier way to do than that. I mean, there are more efficient solutions, blah blah blah, based on length. Like I can, I can apply some logic there, but I like just a easy peasy solution. Like for example, when I'm trying to find D, I know that that's also digit zero. So for example, I'm trying to find D. And which is B and which is D. I can also do this bar uh, digit zero. When I found this, when I find this, I also know that digit zero is D. And then When I'm trying to find C and F, I think you could skip figuring out the segments and figure out digits directly, but since you have the segments already, you can just build the digits. Yeah, I can build the digits. I'm I'm just basically trying to cheat a little bit. So I have digit one, digit seven, digit four, I have digit zero, and then I have uh I have digit 8 already because it's all ones. So I can do this also. Like digit 1, digit 4. Uh, I'll put it at the bottom, I guess. Digit 8 is basically... Mm, not... Zero, I guess. So when trying to find F and C, when I find F and I don't find C, is digit six. Also, instead of the zero, you know, I should do undefined here, I think. So, but well, whatever, yeah. Yeah. doesn't matter much. Okay, so I find digit six. Uh, then here I'm trying to find E and G. E and G. Uh, e and G. E and G. Oh, that's digit nine. So that gives me digit 9. Okay, and then I compute the remaining ones, I guess. So, what do I need? I need a const digit... Uh, two. What's digit two going to be? Oh man! I base it off of other nice things. No. Whatever. Let's do it manually. So it's segment A. Or. Segment, uh, it's so two is A C D E G, A uh, C E A C D E G.
Do I, do I have segment A, E? Yes, I do. Okay. So we have digit 2. Uh, digit 3 is mostly going to be the same. Except instead of E, we have F. And then five. Five is going to be A B D F G. A B D F G. Okay. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to this, when it comes to this stuff, yes, uh, arbitrary precision, like being able to make your own integer type, is pretty pretty nice. Okay, so we have uh, five. What other digits do I need? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I just need nine. Wait, how? No, Ditch 9 is here. It wasn't just suggested. So I think I have all of them at this point. Okay, let's make a let's make a slice of those. Oh, let's just do an array of 10 digits, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I put zero uh, at the beginning. I forgot it. Yep. Um, okay. Man, a lot of work. <laughs> Finally. So we have all our digits. And now... Uh, the goal was supposed to be that we... Um, we need to iterate the final digits. And in there, we need to identify the digit, and then... If you add up all the output values... Oh, 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 oh! Whew. more work still so okay we have the final digits we need to decode each digit and once we decode the damn digit we need to also make a number a result for each digit uh how do we do this const n equals uh, four digits call this f the final digit so for each of the digits or and we also want the index if uh, if the final digit equals the digit that we have on hand, then we break with the index. Oh, I think I want a block here. Else, 
unreachable. I somehow suspect that I'm gonna hit that unreachable. If I made a mistake, I'm gonna hit... Oh my god. I haven't tried this once. <laughs> One minor logic mistake somewhere is gonna cascade into a disaster. Uh, let's pray. Let's pray the undefined. Let's pray the un, un, um, undefined behavior god that that doesn't happen. So if we if the digit matches, then we found the index. That's our n. And then and then we want to basically do result plus equals n times n to the power of n to the power of what? Uh, of position, or rather, it's four digits, right? So four minus pause. So the first digit is going to be ideally multiplied by n the power of 4, 3, 2, one. No, it's, I think it's 3. You can multiply by 10, then add current digit. No, I can't. Let me think. Maybe you're right and I'm just dumb. Yeah, you're right. I put it in result and then I multiply by 10 to shift everything one slot. Yes, you're right. have times equal okay let me see if that makes sense uh no it's wrong because that's not gonna leave a 10 in the final slot a, a digit in the final slot oh god uh like this i think so the first loop is not gonna do anything puts a number below Second time, third time, fourth time. Okay, this should be fine. Let's see. Uh, if you go left to right, you can first first multiply. I think yeah, I, I think first multiply. Otherwise, you have to divide at the end. Yes. 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 Okay. <sighs> so and then. Then we have to compute the result. And once we have computed the result, uh, there's like a counter. Like it was originally called counter. Now it has to be like final result. I haven't even compiled this file like in a long time. Expected two arguments, found one. God damn it. Top count, once the type. Okay, that, that's fair. The chances of this working first try are so low. Oh my god. Unused loop index capture. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Incompatible types, pointer to U7 and U7. Line 19, interesting. D is a pointer, so... Yes. We need to assign to it. Okay. Uh, I like to have a watcher so that you can pass around and save. Um, yeah, that, that's not, that would help with like fixing this syntax error errors, but I, I haven't even tried to sanity check what I was doing halfway through. That, I think, is my biggest problem right now. If something is wrong, there's nothing in here that's gonna help me diagnose, so I'll need to start adding diagnostics to, to try to nail down where the problem was. <laughs> But it's gonna be right first try, I'm sure, I think. Probably not. So incompatible types, use highs and void. Line 125. Uh who told you that? Oh. That's because this was in the wrong place. Sig abort, holy shit. No, reach the unreachable code. No. <laughs> Line 127. So what happened is that we found a digit that did not match any of ours. We never broke. So we reached the unreachable, which means that one of these digits but probably all these digits are like complete nonsense because of mistakes that we encountered. So So here's the question. Am I building them in the wrong way? Am I identifying them in the wrong way or not? Um So, how do we do this then? Uh, I can try to... Okay, generally speaking, it's a good idea to start from the top and start sanity checking from the top towards the bottom. Because, in a sense, you like the more you go towards the bottom, the more problems there can be, and the more these problems are like the result of multiple things going wrong. So, like, if I, if I start printing here the digits, like, I, if I print the digits, I can maybe sanity check them once against one against another. But then it's better to maybe to go to the top. So I think it works fine if the segments are. Do the other ones from segments, those you try to do in line? You mean these ones? Or, oh no, these ones I think you're referring to. I think they should be fine. I'm actually not 100% sure. So, okay, let's let's start from the top and see if we find a place where we... We decide we should stop. Okay, uh, so we break on new line and space, and that correctly gives us the pipe sign when we expect it, and it helps us find unique digits and final digits as expected, hopefully. We actually don't know for sure, but can assume that. So, 1 and 7 find the A segment and DCF candidates. Uh, 
so there's also another thing that I know. The fact that none matches with this, it means that the problem, that the error that I have, uh, does does your parsing handle the space around? Yes, it does. So the problem that we find unreachable, it means that one of these digit, at least one of these digit, it's like nonsense. So it means that we are not like using wrong, how can I say? The mistake is not causing us to have the wrong permutation, choosing the wrong combination to be the wrong digit, but keeping everything still consistent otherwise. It's causing us to basically have a digit that is unrecognizable. Uh, which means that I think I can... Okay, I'm going to start by printing those in any case. So for digits... So zero seems fine. Zero is everything except one thingy. Let me increase this a little bit. So zero seems reasonable. Eight is correct. What the fuck is wrong with nine? <laughs> okay, so nine is definitely wrong. Uh, two, two is also wrong. Why is two like this? Three as well yes three is also so there's like a piece, there's like a missing piece okay so uh, <laughs> uh okay what's up with nine let's go up here so digit nine i do assign digit nine to d how can digit zero six nine how can what So, 9 being wrong is a very interesting problem, because 9 being wrong derives from digits 0, 6, 9 being wrong. Uh, Jeff is... Thank you for the follow. So, this being wrong, let's go up to where we created. Yeah, I don't know the order. I know that I don't know the order. I, I'm always treating these as sets, so I don't know the order. Also, when segments B and D, I don't know which is which. So this is correctly done in the programming. But the fact that digits 0, 6, 9 are like this, it's kind of weird. I'm assigning D to the right place, right? So... So, I'm not sanity checking that this assignment actually assigns three times correctly. So, let me add some sanitation around this. If I, at this point, is different than uh, four or three, uh, three, right? I starts at zero. If I is different than three at this point, panic. Or let's let's put just unreachable. But let's sanity check this. Okay. But it actually did 
do three assignments correctly. No more, no less. Let me print these values then. I, I have trouble understanding how 9 could be a bunch of zeros. Like, what happened to, to get there? It's so weird. Um, so, zero, 0, 6, 9. Okay, so these are correct. What's going on here? There's some there's something sp spooky going on. So digit 069 is correct. So, you know what's happening? It's this assignment that never happens. We need to assert that this happens once. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to break. We need to we need to, I should have done this earlier. So we need to make sure that this happens. Because if this never happens, it's a problem. And so I'm gonna do else unreachable. We're gonna find out which of these which of these doesn't run because what's happening is basically nine never gets assigned, probably for the same reason that E and G never get assigned. And so yeah, let's do this break. And here we do an else unreachable. Uh, so for people that uh, that weren't following, um, or rather they don't know the syntax, basically for loops can have our else branch and the else branch runs if you never break from the for loop if you do break then the else branch doesn't run it's it's the idea is my for loop or my while loop now it's a search i'm searching for something and i'm breaking when i find it which is what i'm doing right now and the else branch is what to do when you didn't find what you were looking for in the loop and here, basically, my, my point is, I I always should find what I'm searching for. Like, there shouldn't be uh, a case where this doesn't happen. So I'm using else unreachable to sanity check that. Also, keep in mind that unreachable is a thing that you do in the bug mode. It doesn't, it's not a thing in release mode. So careful also with that. Okay, now I should hit another unreachable. Yeah, there we go. Line 109. So... We basically successfully find segments C and F, but we fail to find segments E and G, which matches what we were experiencing. Okay, so let's let's look again at this logic. So we take digit four, we add to it segment A. Then we flip all the bits by negating. And that should give us segments E and G. So these seem reasonable. Then we take digit 069. And the common segments are going to be the digit and segment ENG. Mr. Jacobo, thank you for the raid. Hello, whoever is joining. I'm close to solving the eight. Keyword close. Um, 
I made a mistake somehow when building some digits. But ideally, once I figured that out, it should be fine. So, segments E and G and segments D, uh, sorry, digit D and segments E and G tells me if if this digit has segments E and G, when run on 069, it should give me two every single time except once where it gives me one. And then that should allow me to assign D, G and E. Your segment A is wrong. Uh, I think you are right. Because of all the things that can be wrong, digit 4, I, I guess it has to be either digit 4 or segment A, right? Everything else basically flows from there. So let's take a look where I get digit 4. Dig digit 4 doesn't have three segments, does it? Digit 4 has four segments. Let's go double check this. One, two, three, four. Yep. That explains a lot of things, doesn't it? <laughs> and what do you know? We don't hit uh, unreachable anymore. What do you know? What do you know? I don't know. Should we? Should we do it? Is this gonna be it? Ooh. I would say first try. I mean, kinda. <laughs> uh, uh, maybe not exactly first try, try com in the compilation, but I mean, after we figure out that this was a stupid type, alright? I just forgot to, to. I copy pasted this thing and I didn't change the counter. That's what happened. Everything else is fine. I ended up adding a few breaks. So this is actually a very good idea. Uh, since this is uh, advent of code, I'm cutting a lot of corners when implementing these algorithms. And sometimes it's fine. Sometimes you pay the price, right? I was having I was having these for loops that assumed that I would end uh, end inside my if statement once, but I wasn't checking checking for that at all. And at the end, adding that check was so easy. It's like, it, this is such a nice feature, right? Because break and the else branch are there for the search case. It's so neat. It's like two lines that you add, three keyboards, and you automatically have your searchy for loops that uh, actually do tell you if your search is successful or not. And so with that, I was able to find out that the dependency was either one of these two, and it turns out it was obviously the dumbest one because of a copy-paste that didn't get properly updated. Uh, first try only counts if you didn't run with examples and if you compile on a first try. Uh, not in this stream. <laughs> I mean, uh, that was nice. So... I'm up to speed now. So seven hours, there's gonna be uh, exercise nine. I am not actually uh, going to do that as soon as it comes out. It's gonna be always at the same time. Uh, four hours stream today, so that was longer. But hey, so this segment stuff, it wasn't that bad at the end of the day. I, I like it. Originally, as soon as I as I saw the exercise, my brain immediately went to the old exercises in the similar vein from last year, but they were all different. I don't think they had this precise procedure for solving, for disambiguating which is which. But this was, this was nice because it was close to what was last year, but different enough. So, nice. That was nice. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned uh, what to do and what not to do. I think I showed a good mix of things. 
<laughs> things that you can do that are nice, like U7. Things to do that you should not do, like not check for sanity when you write uh, code for your advent of code. So like adding a little bit of sanity checking helps, which is funny because I was doing it for the pipe, right? I was sanity checking here for the pipe and then I got lazy and I stopped sanity check and sprinkling some sanity checks here and there help you give structure to your code, I guess. Yep, and we also find out about a good way of using break and else unreachable in this case. Cool. Uh, so with this, I think I'm going to call it a day. Uh, let's see, who do we have live? Oh my god, I have so many... Wait, are these... These are not the people that I follow. Why? Okay, Twitch. Which is suggesting people at random. Fine. So let's see. What do we have? Uh, working on cal.com. Hmm. Working on our crypto based OnlyFans competitor. I think that's where you guys are going. I don't even care about what the rest is there. <laughs> so, enjoy, have fun. <laughs> See you tomorrow. <laughs>